say hi, Calamity Causes! This video contains spoilers for Xandria Unlimited Calamity Episode 1, as well as some minor spoilers for Campaign 1. Hello everybody, my name is Luna and welcome to Crit Roll Conspiracies, the show where we talk about all the wild or wacky theories that critters have about Critical Role. That's right, I am covering Xandria Unlimited Calamity, the four-part miniseries I am so excited to get stuck in. There were so many details and NPCs, it was just like information flying at us constantly, so I'm sure there's stuff that I've missed, of course, you can let me know in the comments, um, but I will do my best to get what I think is the most important stuff. So without further ado, let's jump into this story of decadence, corruption, and divinity. The first episode of this series is really about establishing the world that the game is taking place in and all of the key figures. So let's do the same. Let's start with an overview of the setting. The game takes place in the city of Avalair, the city of crowns, which is a flying city held aloft by Broomstone in the Age of Arcanum. If you'd like to know more about the Age of Arcanum and where this game fits in the timeline of Critical Role, check out my last video uh, because I did do a breakdown of it there. This city was raised aloft by a group of mages led by Emir Poco and it flies across Exandria following the magical ley lines of the continent. And it does commerce and trading and this path takes it seven years as it goes all the way around the globe and then it eventually returns back to its place of origin to the city of Kathmoira, which is a city that surrounds the ring of land that Avilia used to be on, the, the mountain that it's built on used to be on. And it essentially parks itself there and it takes place in something called the replenishment, which is when it takes all of this magical energy that it has within the city and kind of sends that out into the ground to replenish the land and to help uh, crops and fields flourish and to help a generation of magical children be born. Now, some of you clever clogs out there might be thinking, Avalir? Savalir? Savalir Wood? The Savalier Wood is a cursed forest in the Graying Wildlands, which we looked at a little bit in Campaign 2. And it was established at that time that Savalier means guilt in Elvish. Matt confirmed on Twitter that the city Avalir came to represent the guilt the elves felt about the ensuing calamity, uh, hence kind of the word Savalier coming from that. You sneaky son of a gun, Matthew Mercer. Just very good world building, very, very good. So now that we have a understanding of the setting that the game takes place in, we're going to look at the key figures, uh, the player characters in this game. And this is something that Brennan, I think, does excellently in all of his games, is he's so good at introducing all of the characters in their own sort of settings with their own stories going on. And you don't really know how they're going to come together until it just sort of happens. So so yeah, he likes to, I think, spotlight each character quite heavily um, before bringing them together. So that's what we get here as well. All of the characters are level 14, which I was somewhat surprised at. As I said in my last video, I thought we were going to get a much higher party. Like I was kind of hoping for a level 20 party, but you know, level 14 ain't bad. It's still pretty good. Our first spotlight is Xerxes Ilez, played by Luis Carrazo. And here's everything that we know about him so far. We know that he is a paladin. And as we learn later in the episode, he is a paladin that doesn't draw his divine power from a god. Rather, he draws it directly from the weave in service of the people. I think we usually assume in D&D that a paladin serves a god, but in fact, the paladin powers come from the oath that is sworn, not necessarily what the oath is sworn to. So because he's sworn an oath to the people of Avalir, uh, that is how he is drawing on those divine powers. Hours. Xerxes has some big boy stats. He has a strength of 29 and an AC of 25. That is the highest strength and AC from a player character that we have ever seen in Critical Role. Luis confirmed on Twitter that the high strength score is from a belt of giant strength, which increases your strength score to 29. Xerxes is the first knight of Avalir and he lives in the tower of the first knight along with his griffin Tempest. His griffin is made like its body is made of like amethyst crystal and swirling stars essentially just made of like pure magic. So pretty! Xerxes is a tall dark and handsome man so of course he needs a tall dark and tragic backstory. We learn that he was married to Vandron who has passed away uh, some indeterminate amount of time ago and together they had a son called Ilias and sadly it seems like Xerxes and Ilias have an estranged relationship. He hasn't seen his son since he was about seven years old. In fact the last time that Avelia landed for the replenishment and now he's almost 14. We also learn that Ilias is living with some family members of Guildmaster Nidus who is uh, Lou Wilson's character that we'll meet a little bit later but he is living in Kathmoira so he is not living on the city of Avelia. Xerxes spotlight opens with a 
dream, a dream of fire, of explosions, of the city kind of rendered into chaos and his mouth filled with blood. Blech. And he hears draconic whispers of Gordranus. Now we know that Gordranus is the city that the Petraea gods held their seat of power in before they launched an attack on Vasselheim, which kicked off the calamity. In this dream, he sees his son Ilias uh, fishing into like a void of stars and his son says, I think I've caught something and he, he disappears into the hole. And then there's this huge red figure, like beyond, almost beyond comprehension how big it is. And it is horned and it holds out its hand uh, to Xerxes. And in that hand is a tree. Xerxes sees a vision of his husband Evandron uh, walking towards and under this tree, holding an amulet. And he says, something is wrong. And then that memory kind of shatters and, and fades away. And then- Searing burst of light. Another figure tall as a mountain. You see a gleaming golden figure land with one colossal foot on the throat of this horned figure. Press him further into the rubble of Avalir. Mm. And you see the horned figure looks to you <laughs> and cries out. His hands are still out? You stand now in the palm of his hand. You look up. The face of the being above you is no face. There is no warmth to the eyes. You see the pitiless, featureless glare of the sun itself. Turn your eyes from this sinner. He is beyond redemption. What has he done? He has betrayed his kin. You see the horned figure turns to you and says, it's all right, it's all right. Just ask yourself, Xerxes, whom did we betray? I'm curious to know what all of you think, but I think it's fairly safe to assume that these two gods are Asmodeus, who is the Lord of the Hells, and the Dawn Father, or Pelor, who is as he's known in D and D lore. Brennan appears to be portraying Asmodeus in quite a sympathetic light in this scene. Uh, it certainly seems that the Dawn Father is the scary, terrifying, vengeful, angry god, which you know kind of tracks with a lot of stories of gods in general throughout history. Even though they're the good guys, they can still be, they can still get really mad. And I wonder if this grieving, sorrowful Asmodeus is because of the story of how the Betrayer gods grieved over the destruction of their creations and they wanted to just kind of like wipe them off and start all over again. So maybe they kind of see the inevitable end of life and they're feeling sorrowful about that. I don't know. I think it's also really interesting to think about how this vision, this dream, we don't really know what it is. We're seeing it through Xerxes' eyes. So I wonder what this says about his perception of the gods and his views on them. Yeah, I don't know. Let me know in the comments what you think about this. Next, we meet Loquacious Seely, who is Sam Regal's character. He is playing a bard warlock. Love to see Sam playing a high charisma character again. Loquacious is a broadcaster for the Herald's Tome, which seems to be the news service of Avalir. Arya, Arya, I need my copy, my copy. Oh, I Mr. Seely, right Mr. Seely, got you right here. Yes, sir, here you go. <laughs> wow. Count me down, count me down. Oh, in, I, in how five, do I look? Do I look good? four, yes. All three, right, here we go. two. <clears throat> good morning and salutation, sundry subjects of the soaring city of Avalir. I am Lo Loquacious Seely, your handsome and helpful Herald. I, uh, I report the news that shapes Avalir's views. <laughs> Tonight, as we all know, marks the eve of the replenishment and our return to Kath Moira, our terrestrial sister city. Remember, folks, make sure to fasten all those loose valuables and belongings tightly, <laughs> as our friends in the Navigators Guild wish to remind us that there's always a 
pinch of turbulence in our descent back towards Exandria Firma. Loquacious is a celebrity. He seems to have fingers in every pie. He's got an army of attendants around him at all times, assistants and, and uh, things like that, doing whatever he wants them to do. And he's like, no, I couldn't possibly sign any autographs while also really wanting the attention and wanting to sign the autographs. He kind of gives me very much the vibes of Caesar from Hunger Games. In fact, this whole city does give me those kind of Hunger Game vibes of that decadence and excess that the capital has. In this short scene, we learn about him influencing an election that he's putting forward his favored candidate by helping with media coverage. Not like we've ever seen that happen in our own time. <laughs> Loquacious heads off out of this scene to speak with the arcane architect about some screens that are out of commission because he really needs those readings. And let us move to that arcane architect because this is Laren Koromarsili who is played by Abria Iyengar. She is an elven wizard who seems to be in charge of all of the spell engines and things that power the city as well as a team of artificers. And yes, she does have a hyphenated surname of Sili because she is Loquacious's ex-wife which gives us some juicy charged scenes between the two of them. Oh, thank you so much. You see, I've been trying to reach you through the normal means and it seems that someone's been ignoring someone else's, you know, when we separated, we said that we would try to remain friends, try to keep open clear lines of communication. Okay. You know, we are we a day out the from the replenishment? Uh, yeah, what? Uh, all the Reason, Hairstyle all the more check reason. do you need from me? You look beautiful. What do you need? What do you need? Well, what do thank you, you. Thank you. I'm just saying we're going to be down there a lot, probably mm -hmm. mingling in the same, uh, with the same folks, glad handing with the same people down there. If, if we can't even talk amongst ourselves, then it's going to be very awkward for us. It's going to be very awkward for me, frankly, having to explain why there's this weird coldness in the room and, you know, I Are know that you you're obsessed your with your work. Social status, my problem right now. You don't have to. Just reply to my messages. Oh, the ones from Aria. <laughs> Aria is just my assistant. Mm -hmm. Laren is busy getting everything ready for the replenishment and gets word that they will be landing or the city will be landing about 10 minutes before sunrise the next day. Laren has an interest in celestial solstices, which are times when the veils between the worlds are very thin and great magic, uh, great magical work can be done at this time. And she built a grand geometer, which can read the ley lines. Now, I'm not exactly sure what it's measuring, but this grand geometer, Lara knows that if she gets a reading of 0 0.025, that that means that there is some shifting of the ley lines. She learns in this scene that currently it is reading 0.5, a significant increase. So she is very excited. This is a huge moment for her. She's been working towards this for so long. And it's both the relief that all of the things that she's sacrificed could be worth it for this one shot and the terror that she has so little time to take advantage of this tremendous moment. And our next character spotlight is on Guildmaster Nidus, who is played by Lou Wilson. Nidus is known as the Dragon of Avalir, and he is a bard slash dragon sorcerer and former pirate. He appears to be at the center of commerce in this city, having built a lot of the uh, automatons as well that help things run, like the Karahulks, which are the big kind of wizard buses that they can get around on, as well as the Hodmodods, which are like fabric constructs that uh, can help out with all kinds of different tasks. And he also founded a sorceress university where young sorcerers could go to learn how to use their powers. Uh, Nidus is like kind of a stocky dude, uh, like right around 5'10". Um, he has uh, long dreads uh, cuffed with gold that come and lay just on his shoulder, uh, like wearing the uh, red of the golden scythe. Uh, uh, like a red coat uh, with uh, a like gorgeous golden pin uh, with the signature of the scythe uh, with a cape draped along his back. He wears one of those funny like kind of Renaissance merchants ca floppy caps uh, uh, to one side. Over his right eye is a scar. Over his left eye, you see three tattoo. Uh, he has tattoos of X's. He's got three uh, over his eye, uh, a, a, a beard that ends 
hands in a golden ring uh, uh, and then set in his uh, face are uh, two eyes of hazel flecked with literal gold. Nidus is busy getting things prepared for the Parade of Beasts, which is in celebration of the replenishment. And at this point, he confirms with Captain Esperard about forestalling a payment for something. They're talking about payment being owed to someone and uh, Nida says that this payment needs to be held off until after the replenishment. He's a little bit cagey in his responses about this, not really giving, I guess, a significant reason why it needs to be held off. So it makes me wonder, does this merchant have like a cash flow problem? Is that what's going on? He also has another meeting with Magister Milas Friend, who I think is like kind of lower social tier than Nidus. He doesn't actually know who he is. Um, and he comes to Nidus asking if there might be a surplus of ether after the replenishment that he could potentially acquire. It's kind of some very like shady business. And Nidus is not impressed that he's being approached by this. I don't think he's above doing shady business because that does seem to be kind of his thing. But it's the fact that it's someone kind of lower down, he feels like that this is a matter beneath him. So he quickly dismisses him and ends the conversation. Moving away from the vault, we head over to Cloudstone and to a massive marble building. Where striding down the corridors is Serret Agrumpnen, otherwise known as Pinch to his friends, who is played by Travis Willingham. Uh, you see, uh, standing tall, but with a, a cloak and, and a hood pulled up just behind his, uh, his feathered head. Uh, a six and a half foot tall um, uh, ice fura, so uh, a, a third person, if you will, with very white feathering uh, that falls into brown tips, mm -hmm. um, a dark beak with slightly gray, slightly bluish eyes, mm -hmm. proud, strong shoulders, strong wings tucked back, but, but fairly folded back beneath a, uh, a cloak, um, and uh, a badge of some sort that's just slightly hidden on his mm -hmm. on his person. His arms sort of tucked in tight, only to, if for no other reason than to hide the double holstered axes, hand axes that are underneath his his arm, and wraps uh, around his his wrists and his taloned fingers and feet um, as he as he moves along. And this is a uh, Serret, a Grumpnen. Serret is a rogue, although given Travis's past behavior, is he really a rogue? Yeah, I think he is. <laughs> uh, we do get this really fun kind of like Dick Tracy detective type character. It's, it's fun seeing these kind of like noir style stereotypes mashed into this like arcane fantasy setting. Serret is the senior site warden of the Eyes of Avalir, which I think is a like kind of police or investigatory force here on the city. Serret meets with someone called Orwin, and I know I'm not the only person who heard Orum in that moment, about reports out of Vasselheim that a mage called Vespen Chloris had gone missing. It's been rumored that Vespen was trying to recreate the ritual that the Raven Queen used to ascend to godhood. Using some arcane technology in conjunction with items from Vespen's sanctum, they actually managed to recreate the sanctum so you can walk through it and you can investigate it and you can see exactly how it was and you can move it forward and back in time to see how things have changed. That's so freaking cool! Serik, with a 31 investigation, examines a corroded piece of metal uh, that was one of the items that was brought here to Avalir and realizes that it's part of a bow, a magic bow that has been disenchanted and one that is quite larger than the piece of metal that is left behind. And whatever disenchanted the bow also seems to have disenchanted part of a summoning circle that was on the floor of the sanctum. Now, even in this like time of a high magic, disenchanting things is really, really difficult. It's still a really, really high level of magic not available to most people. So whatever managed to do this must have been extremely powerful. Sarek has seen cases before where mages have tried to recreate this ritual and there's usually some evidence left behind like, the bodies kind of splattered everywhere. Uh, so he is very unsettled that there is no evidence whatsoever um, of this ritual going awry. Now, of course, we, the audience, know about Vespin. We know that he did want to ascend to godhood, but rather than trying to recreate the ritual, he actually reached out to the betrayer gods to try and make a deal whereby if he released them, they would make him a god to give him some of that power. And finally, we meet our last character, Pesha Porco, played by Marisha Ray. <laughs> You see a middle-aged, although you wouldn't be able to tell, <laughs> elven woman, clear ivory skin with hair that is silvery white, 
almost reflects the sky around her. She has a long kind of collared, breasted coat over top that stretches down like a, a gown in an emerald green that almost has its own silken sheen to it with a kind of teal blue indigo <laughs> name your color dress, depending on how it hits the light mm -hmm. underneath. In her hair, she has this almost like a sun ray fascinator made of gold where pieces of her hair are falling through it and around her neck is a rigid golden ring. If you look closely at it, it has tiny blue crystals, almost like tiny Swarovskis that are broomstone Ooh. and it lightly levitates oh, and go. rotates and spins around her at all time mm. as well as a orb, a glowing orb that is her focus that also just kind of hovers almost celestial, planetary in nature. She looks as if the outfit was made for her this morning, because it probably was. <laughs> <laughs> her makeup is impeccable. She is the most put together woman you have ever seen in your life. And we meet Patia at the Archcept, which is the home of the True Seven, the seven mages that rule over the city of Avalir. Within the Archcept is a giant hundred foot statue of Emir Porco, who was the chief mage who lifted the city up into the sky all those years ago. And Emir is also Patia's grandfather. Patia is the keeper of the scrolls and the archmage of the Librarium Incantatum. And while she is here at this statue, she is approached by one of the seven themselves, Eldamir, an ancient elf who has been on the council since Avalir was first established. I love Eldamir so much. I feel like I could just watch Brennan be an old man forever. It's just truly delightful. Eldamir is accompanied by an apprentice called Loris, who informs Patia that one of the other apprentices will be retiring soon, leaving a spot open, which Patia does seem very interested in. Loris also speaks about the possibility that Aeor is going to launch an attack on Lathrus. Aeor is another floating city that we've heard about in Critical Role, and apparently will be attacking not because Lathrus is considered a threat or has done anything to Aeor, but to test something, to do a dry run, I believe was the word. Essentially like testing weapons on an entire city that hasn't done anything wrong, that is not good. This is when the episode takes a break and it's when I'm gonna take a little break as well to ask you that if you've enjoyed this video so far to subscribe because we're so close to 10,000 subscribers. We could maybe get it uh, after this video. I don't know, we're almost there. You hold the power. Okay, that's it, that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> all right, we return after the break to a grand party that Patia is holding in celebration of the Eve of the Replenishment. There is a last minute addition to the guest list requested by someone from the Ring of Silver and this guest is a champion of the divine who will be bringing a wolf with him. Don't worry, we're gonna get to that in a moment. The party begins and all of the characters begin to arrive as of course, this is how we get the party together all into the one room. Nidus arrives with a gift of a rare tree from Marquette, and Loquacious arrives with a date. But her wow. her name is is Bolo, I think. Bolo. Bolo. Um, she's uh, she's a friend of a friend. We were sort of set up. This is the second uh, time I've ever met her. She's gorgeous, isn't she? Melinda. Melindra mentioned that people were asking for plus ones at the last oh, minute. Oh, yes, I, I, yes. I told everyone that that would be fine, so. All right, fantastic. Um, nice to meet you, Ambola. <laughs> no, no, come on, man. Bolo. How many Bolo? Bolo wants to be a reporter like me. No. I, eventually, I'm going to be a reporter. No, no. no. I have no. taken her under my wing. You know what, you know what Bolo? Why don't you go fetch us some drinks and some, maybe just do some mingling, you know? There's a lot of stuff that you can hear by um, picking up on people's <laughs> conversations in these events. You might get some leads and clues. So start practicing, maybe take some mental notes and get us some drinks, all right? In AOR, sometimes it is illegal to ask these questions. Guys, I'm starting to think that Aeor isn't a very nice place. <laughs> Once everyone has arrived, the group goes to a private table where they can have a private conversation. It's where this place is magically protected from eavesdroppers. Xerxes shares his dream about the gods and Laren recognizes Gordranus as being draconic for gathering of shadows. And Patia connects that to an ancient text from the schism where the Lord of the Hells said, put me where you will in darkness, I will gather my shadows to me. Seret also shares his findings from the crime 
scene and shows the bow. Xerxes feels a strong, strong celestial presence from the bow. And Nidus, being familiar with all kinds of metals as well as magical artifacts, realizes that this bow once was 12 feet tall, extremely, extremely big, and that it is made from celestial gold, gold which is wrought from the heavens itself. So this bow must have belonged to a solar, a particular kind of angel. Laren knows that no mortal could disenchant a bow like this. It's just not possible. So if Vespin didn't do it, then... Who did? I think given all of these context clues, it is safe to assume that Vespin has managed to contact a betrayer god, potentially unleashing one of them, and that is what disenchanted the bow as well as the summoning circle. Laren also realizes that this fragment of bow, this celestial gold, is what she needs to do a plane shift spell. And this is the last thing that she needs for her plan. Then we cut to... Announcing the champion of the Matron of Ravens, Pervan Su! Oh, shut your mouth, Brennan Leopold again! <laughs> um, and you see walking. What? <laughs> you see uh, walking uh, through the doors of the Palazzo Porco, no. uh, a young man. Long dark hair, light brown skin, a severe, grave expression on his face. Oh, the one And you see, he's got a wolf with him. I think Travis was all of us in that moment. <laughs> so if you're not familiar with this name, Pervon Sol was the first champion of the Raven Queen. The reason that we know of him from campaign one is that he wore this magical armor called the Death Walker's Ward, which was a powerful magic item now known as one of the Vestiges of Divergence. In campaign one, Vox Machina recovered this armor along with a pendant, pendant which magically contained Pervon's wolf, Goldrick. Brennan points out that Pervon is likely a level seven or a level eight kind Kind of character that he's not at his height of power, he's not super powerful just yet. And he appears to be a bit of an oddity here. This is a city that doesn't place any stock in the power of the gods. They'd much rather focus on the gifts and the achievements of mortality. And so having someone here who kind of like worships the gods, who draws their powers from a god, they see as kind of like quaint, I guess, I suppose old fashioned. The champion is here because he wants to speak with the seven. He has something he wants to discuss with them and he's expecting to get an audience where which people are very amused by because it's not sort of something you just roll in and expect to be able to talk with the highest mages of the city. Sarat asks the Dean why she is so concerned with someone having attempted this ritual because, you know, we all know that it's never successful. Nobody has ever come close. And as she responds, I haven't the faintest idea, he feels his ring kind of pulse, letting him know that she is lying to him. I think this magic item that Seret has is likely a ring of truth telling. Laren leaves the party at this point and heads back to the heart of Avalir along with the celestial goal. And Patia uses her detect thoughts to kind of bounce around the room and see if anyone is talking about anything that the party are currently interested in. She hears Gordranus, and then one of the fabric hobmadods just falls into the ground, inanimate. Seret manages to grab that and sort of rush it off away into a private room. And while this is happening, Loquacious and Xerxes catch up with Pervon and sort of apologize for the rudeness of the guests and have a bit of a conversation with him. The champion shares that the Raven Queen is concerned about something that is happening on Exandria, that she can feel something happening, but she can't see it. She checked in with all of the other gods and they all felt something as well, but none of them felt an attack on their domains, meaning that no one had tried to ascend and sort of take their place in the way that she had with the God of Death. From this, she has drawn the conclusion that Vespin has reached out to the Betrayer Gods. We cut from this moment back to Seret, who is investigating the Hobmadod in a private room. And again, with another investigation roll of 31, he realizes that he is not alone in the room. There is somebody else here. Moving quickly, he attacks the invisible creature, slaying it, revealing that it is a either like a construct, like a flesh construct of some kind, or an animated corpse, something creepy and gross like that. And then, Looking in the mirror, he sees. You hear behind you from the mirror. Oh. You will never reach the wild mother's embrace in time. Are you looking for something? You turn around and in the mirror you see a shape in mist. 
swimming in the fog in the mutilated face of Vespin Chloris. Wow, what an end, what an opener to this series. I was on the edge of my seat this entire time. I'm so invested in this. I'm so heartbroken because obviously we know it's all gonna end, um, but I can't wait to see where things go from here. I think the pacing of this series is going to feel so different because a lot of the time in Critical Role and also just in D&D games in general, you usually get characters who are low level, they've been taken out of their setting and put somewhere where they're exploring and they're discovering things and they're meeting people, which is fantastic. It's super duper fun. But there's something about having a game where the people are in their home bases. They're places where they feel comfortable, where they know everybody, where they have things happening around them at all times. These kind of like complex day-to-day -day routines that they're just a part of. And we get to kind of jump straight into that and see it uh, with open eyes, even though we don't really know who everybody is and how everything works. Um, we're kind of coming into it fresh. So I really enjoy that and I'm enjoying that we're getting that this uh, this series. And I'm really excited to see Brennan's dramatic side. You know, I often see him doing comedy stuff through Dimension 20, which is all excellent. And, you know, he always has that great dramatic flair. He can do spooky, scary stuff really well. It's fun to see him leaning on that side much more heavily for this series. All right, so I wanna hear your theories about where this series is going to go what we're going to see coming up over the next three episodes. Put them in the comments below. I can't wait to see them and I will examine them in the next video. If you've made it this far, don't forget to subscribe so we can get to 10K. And if you're looking for a place to chat Critical Role with some other wonderful critters, then jump into my Discord because we have a whole section devoted to Critical Role where we have a live watch party every week and we can discuss and talk about all of our different theories. Thank you so much to my patrons and YouTube members and a special welcome to new member Makai Moody. If you'd like to support the channel, you can do so by becoming a member right here on YouTube or signing up over at patreon.com forward slash lubofen. That's all from me and I'll see you next time. Bye!